Hello, my name is Tom Ormerod from the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom and I'm presenting this paper with my co-author Jim McGregor from the University of Victoria, Columbia, British Columbia. In this paper we will be comparing two theories of insight, the representational change theory and the criterion for satisfactory progress theory and we'll report two experiments that evaluates predictions deriving from each theory. In the discussion, we'll note how both theories seem to play a role, but that a fundamental concept, the idea of constraint relaxation, is actually not necessary for insight. Representational change theory was introduced by Noblik, Olsen, Heider and Reinhus in their seminal paper of 1999. RCT emphasizes how the initial problem representation elicits prior knowledge, and that prior knowledge can either help solve a problem or it can hinder the solution. They argue that solving insight problems requires the relaxation of constraints imposed by prior knowledge, and that constraint relaxation is one of the mind's responses to persistent failure. To test their theory, they conducted a number of innovative experiments with matchstick algebra problems. So in a matchstick algebra problem, the task is to make the arith arithmetic sum represented by the Roman numerals work by moving one match only. In the first sum, you have four equals five plus seven, whereas the second one is three equals three plus three. Under the RCT, the first is predicted to be easier than the second because the second one requires the mathematical knowledge that is making the solution hard to be overcome and yet that mathematical knowledge is so general and fundamental to all our understanding of mathematics. Both problems require the operator of plus to be changed. However, the first problem simply requires the movement of one of the matches to another number to make the sum work. The second problem, on the other hand, requires the creation of a tautology and Noblik and colleagues argue that a tautology goes against our fundamental understanding of mathematical equations as having a, an x equals function of y type of structure. Thus, to relax the constraint of that, that scope of that knowledge is much harder uh, than relaxing the scope that you have to change a, a plus to a, a number. An alternative account was offered by us in our paper, um, which we call Criterion for Satisfactory of Progress Theory. Uh, CSPT emphasizes not the effect of prior knowledge, but the role of monitoring the progress that each move might make towards a solution. So it's a strategic rather than knowledge based account. We introduce a maximization heuristic where individuals select moves on the basis of the value that they appear to make in progressing towards a hypothesized goal. Once the on pass is reached, the maximization constraint is relaxed. So in this instance, there's constraint relaxation, but it's strategic rather than knowledge based. In a later paper, we introduced a minimization heuristic. The concept here being that individuals will represent in the problem space only information about which they are certain. And this is a way of controlling the size of the problem space to make search finite. The problem space then is only expanded once on passes have been reached by move discovery under relaxed maximization. We tested our theory using the nine dot problem. So in the nine dot problem, you have nine dots arranged as a square, and the task is to draw four straight lines, canceling each of the nine dots without taking your pen off the page once you've started. In one of our experiments, we gave participants the first line of the solution. And some, in one condition, they had a first line which extended horizontally beyond the dot array. And in another condition, participants received a diagonal line that stayed within the dot array. All theories, including RCT, would predict that the horizontal line would be more facilitative as a first move than the diagonal line. CSPT, on the other hand, predicts that the diagonal line would be more facilitative. And indeed, this is exactly what we found. Our argument is that if you look at a typical first move in these problems, for the horizontal line, you see that the first move will cancel seven out of the nine dots. And that is still making satisfactory progress. So it seems like a worth a move that is worth persevering with. 
whereas almost immediately your attempts with the diagonal line fail to cancel as many dots as you need to maintain satisfactory progress. In this case, they only cancel six out of nine dots. Thus, people will expand the problem space faster in the case of the diagonal version than in the horizontal version because they've experienced criterion failure. They fail to make enough progress. Recently, we've begun to question whether this notion of criterion failure um, and the resulting constraint relaxation are satisfactory explanations. Now we are proposing in work that is in preparation that insight is still achieved by two processes, but rather than being maximization and minimization heuristics, maximization is still there, but we've replaced minimization with a, a general idea discovery module. Maximization in our new theory is continuous. It doesn't get relaxed at any point. At all times, individuals are trying to maximize the value of the moves they attempt. But when they make an attempt, the properties of that attempt are identified and classified in memory, as well as the outcome of that move. So in essence, in our theory, individuals are recording a consistent and constant set of states that they've explored, which may have failed, but nonetheless can contain useful information. In some respects, this idea is similar to Kaplan and Simon's idea of detecting invariance while solving insight puzzles. The second component is idea discovery. On reaching on pass, the properties of previous attempts that have been tried are accessed. They're accessed um, in a way that is consistent with the concept of minimization. In essence, people look to what they've just tried because that's the thing that they are certain about. They know what those attempts achieved and what their properties were. So they try those before seeking other information. And as a result of taking these properties and adding them to previous attempts, new maximizing moves can be discovered. We're currently implementing this as a computational model in ACTAR. To test this account against the uh, RCT account, we conducted two experiments that have essentially the same design. Um, participants in experiment one, we had 129 people and 144 in experiment two. Following the method of Noblik et al, participants were pre-tested for their Roman numeral knowledge. Each experiment had a two by two between subjects design, where in one factor we manipulated predictions to do with RCT, and in the other factor we manipulated predictions to do with CSPT. So for RSP, RCT, we manipulated the, the tightness of chunks um, in the first experiment, and in the second experiment, we manipulated the scope of a constraint. In CSPT, we manipulated the value of moves by changing the Roman numerals involved in each equation to either have low value, as in the case of Noblik et al's experiment, or to use high value numerals such as 50 and 100. The idea behind this is that high value moves, according to CSPT, should attract participants to look at the queue of a high number, making the most progress towards changing the value of the sum. The general procedure was that participants were tested individually in a group setting, and each person solved one matchstick algebra problem, being allowed five minutes for solution. Problems were presented on paper with 10 repetitions to allow multiple trials. And after 30 seconds, we asked our participants to draw their first attempt. In experiment one, we compared tightness of chunk against value. So problem A, eight equals four divided by three, requires the uh, breaking up of a loose chunk, the three, and turning the uh, division into a multiplication. Whereas the problem C, the tight chunk, requires the breaking up of an operator plus uh, to, to release a match. And that the plus is viewed by Noble et al to be a tighter chunk because it's uh, more bound together as a single object. We also manipulated values, so whereas problem A has relative, uh, problems A and C have relatively low value numbers, problems B and D involve 50 and 100, thereby um, showing guiding participants to cues as to how much number, how much change will be made by changing each number. The results show that, as predicted by RCT, chunk tightness does impact upon solution rates. Loose chunk problems were solved more often than tight chunk problems. However, this effect was mediated by problem value. If you look at the solution rates for 
tight chunk but high value problems, they are the same as for loose chunk low value problems. Uh, if you look at the gray columns, those are showing the uh, number of percentage of times that participants first move involved a match taken from a loose chunk. And what you can see there is in the high value problems, they're much less likely to take a match from the, 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 uh, the loose chunks, uh, both even when the solution requires a loose chunk as well as the uh, ones where they don't. So it does seem then as if in whilst problem difficulty is being affected by tightness of chunk, the likelihood of solution seems to be a factor as much of the value of each move. In experiment two, we took the tautology problems of Nobler et al and we compared them against a, a reverse tautology. So in problem E, two equals three minus one, um, where the required solution is two equals two equals two, that's a standard one, but participants were also given, in another group, were given four equals two equals two, where the tautology is presented to them. And the presentation in the initial problem representation of the tautology ought to break the constraint of prior knowledge. So according to RCT, standard tautology problems should be much harder than reverse tautology problems. Again, we manipulated value. So for example, in problem F, two equals 51 minus two, the 51 orientates participants to the 51, changing that will make the most value change to the whole solution. Likewise, in problem H, 100 equals 50 equals 50, again, orientating participants to the value of the numbers rather than the, the tightness or scope of the prior knowledge. As predicted by RCT, the standard tautology problem was by a long way the hardest of the problems. Um, however, the standard problem with high value numbers was much easier and was solved almost as often as the reverse tautology problems. Note also that the, uh, the grey bars in this diagram represent the percentage of participants who chose the highest value numeral in their first move. And even with the standard low value problems, you see a preponderance of participants selecting the highest possible number to change first indicative of the fact that it's the value of particular moves that is guiding participants' solution attempts. So both theories seem to have gained some support from these experiments. Problem difficulty is clearly mediated by chunk tightness and scope. These wouldn't be insight problems were it not for the effect of prior knowledge. But we argued that solution rates are actually more a function of value than of their initial difficulty. And it's the value that participants are using to cue their move selections, and those value changes are overcoming effects of chunk, tightness, or scope. The results lead us to question then whether constraint relaxation is really necessary for solution. Is it really necessary to abandon one's knowledge of mathematics or one's desire to make progress? It seems unlikely to us that the mind will say, on my next attempt, I must forget everything I know about maths. But it's equally implausible for the mind to say, on our next attempt, I must try and make less progress than I normally would. These ideas don't seem to be realistic psychological concepts of how the mind searches for new ideas. In this particular problem and in other knowledge lean problems like this, we argue that the search for previous attempts is the source for new ideas. When you've tried something, even if it's failed, you learn something and you can reuse the knowledge you've learned in novel ways in later attempts once you've reached on pass. So to conclude, in our view, the mind's response to persistent failure is not to forget what it knows, it's to search for something better. And we're better to look than what you've already tried. Thank you very much. <laughs>